I always compare the virtual team with the atom, where you have in the atom, you have a nucleus and then various particles flying around. And in a virtual team, similarly, we, our goal, our aim is to retain the gravity, I call it, you know, the, the gravity between the, between the particles, which are the team members in this case, towards the nucleus. But the nucleus is not the manager or whatever happened to be project manager, HR manager. This is the team purpose and goal. And therefore we do it in a creative team effort. <laughs>
get them translated, working with the publishers, that's a no small feat in and of itself. So I just really welcome you to the show and I'm so thankful that you're here because we're gonna have a lot to talk about. And first and foremost, um, this time that we've had, this last 12 months of craziness, not only the pandemic and Black Lives Matter, the inauguration, uh, the Trumpocalypses, the, the, the uh, craziness going around the world with the Brexits and uh, the Green New Deal and, and uh, Belarus and, and many other crazy tumultuous things happening in our world, um, probably has been a pretty positive spin in some ways for you because you've been working with virtual power teams and virtually for a long time and you literally wrote the book, so to say. Um, so that brings me to the hard question. And I want you to be brutally honest with me. Has all this past years of experience given you resilience, given you preparedness? Say, I've been talking about this, working on this, using these tools for decades. Now is my time to shine. And it's actually worked out very well where you've seen some really positive things emerge. How have you weathered the pandemic and how has it been up until this point? Yes. Now it's been 2020 was my busiest year ever, you know, all over the place. I had gigs with big multinationals, had big with scaling digital companies, which also from the pandemic, they had a lot of attention and uh, some of them scaled. I work with NGOs, so you name it. Um, it's been for my, as you say, um, for me as a person, and my motto is uniting global talents to resolve the toughest challenges of humanity. So initially I was uniting talents to resolve business challenges, to make global teams in the corporate world work. Uh, but gradually I moved on to like uh, middle size or small size companies that want to expand internationally. Uh, then came the NGOs like, I don't know, Teach for All, now World Food Program, um, Youth Against AIDS, many international global organizations where without a boss, without a salary or bonus, um, same principles of my method that I've been honing over the last 20 years as a manager and seven years as an entrepreneur, um, they I've kind of adjusted it for the size, for the industry, for being a non-profit or for-profit. Uh, but really 2020 was the accelerator of everything where um, I had not just keynotes, which is my passion. And we've met at an event and we had a joint event, we shared the stage, but I did a lot of also groundwork workshops to make you know the companies ready, adaptable for the new normal or the current or the now normal. Um, so it's been really a, a very busy period. Uh, it's been sometimes exhausting but it's been very rewarding, by far my most rewarding year. That's, that's top, amazing. As I said, on top, I've written this book uh, because yeah, yeah. I've been approached by Wiley first book. It was more to protect my kind of intellectual property. Uh, and it had a very good resonance, six languages, including Chinese and Spanish and German, English, and so on. The second Wiley approached me and said, we need a book on remote work. We need a book on now home office and how to work remotely and so on. So I said, okay, let's, let's, I had, since the first book, I had a number of case studies. So a number of experiences different. And I put another story, which is not just business like the first one, but it's really power team beyond borders. It's about resolving the energy conflict, going for sustainable energy. This is the storyline which demonstrates the method. So it's been on all fronts, on the creative side and on the delivery side as well. Yeah, and it's been a nice mix because now that you've had a little bit of or had a little bit more downtime as far as traveling to speak at events, you had more time to focus to get the book out. But actually, you were still putting the virtual power teams and the virtual practices in, into place, but you were still traveling to, to that, which is, is a huge time consumption. And so now it actually almost lets you laser focus in and create this new, you know, um, not only what you've been speaking about, kind of the, the humans of new work and how do we do it and how do we do it effectively with the principles. It was a very unique time. Uh, the same for me, busier than ever, projects quadrupled. And, and so I totally 
align and, and, and know where you come from. Um, I, I want to back up a little bit even further to what I mentioned in your biography. So you are a, a, a passionate athlete. You get outside, you exercise, you do a lot of different things. You've done uh, javelin and, and discus and kind of more of this uh, track and field type of sports as well, but as well as other kind of uh, exercise and sports and you're very avid on the outdoors. But you, when we um, first met shortly thereafter, you, uh, you says, hey, I'm going to, what was it, Australia or New Zealand? New Zealand. New Zealand to, to the world senior games. It's like, a, it's like a world senior Olympic games type of a, a deal. And, and you did yes. very well and, and came back with some medals and some great accolades and, and, and uh, very proud of you. But that's also a part of an ingrained process of, of how you live your life, how your daily structure is, that, that it's a work-life balance. It's, an, it's a making sure that you as an athlete are, are up to speed and on your game um, for the day. But at not two separate worlds, you've combined them nicely into one world that works, uh, you know, for you very nicely, but you're, I also see not only through the book, and we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the book, that it's a world that's not a polar opposites, because on top of that, you're the, the, the father of five wonderful girls. And uh, uh, one of them who's really had some success in the last two to three years uh, for the climate and area, which I hope to, to, to coax her onto the podcast as well. But those are balancings. What, what most people, especially during this time, would see is all different types of areas and, and globes, you know, the, the life, the family, the work, you know, and they're all different, but they're, they don't really overlap. And you found a way to truly get them all into one type of a lifestyle and culture and make them work. And I really, uh, I really say hats off, kudos to you. But can you give us a little bit more insight on, on those things, those areas, athlete, father, family life, and work, how you've been able to do that. And I don't want you to give away the farm of what's in your book and what you teach, mm -hmm. but maybe give us some tips that dur during this time, of, of, of the lockdown, um, people aren't happy with their human zoos. They've had more domestic violence, uh, more issues with their kids, and because now they have to become an educator of their kids. Can you kind of give us some tools how, how you've done it, how we should do it, maybe some good examples? Yeah, that, great, great question, Mark. And thanks for, for sharing. It was World Master Games in New Zealand, and it was like proper Olympic Games for seniors. They were 28,000 athletes. So the whole Oakland was flooded with senior athletes between starting from like 40 until 100 plus. So there were several hundred plus athletes which run 100 meters and so on sprinting. It's amazing to see what human, human body can do regardless of the age. So I was one of them and um, I managed to get a golden medal in discus so like world champion in discus and then the bronze in javelin. So I was very happy. My daughter uh, Gary, she's the middle one, was with me, so she was filming all my performances, and I was given the medal by Sergei Bubka, the, the you know the famous uh, pole vault jumper, and he's currently, I think, whatever vice president of the Olympic Committee. So, and we had a chat even. He spent probably two minutes with me speaking in Russian <laughs> about uh, Bulgaria and the senior sports. So it was very rewarding uh, for sure. Before that, to reach there, there was a lot of hard work, but maybe that explains a little bit why, because uh, being specialist on virtual power teams, even before Corona, I spent a lot of time online. So, you know, as a manager, my teams were always remote. So we had all the structured communication online. So I spent a lot of time sitting or standing, but in front of a computer. So my way to balance off the virtual world was really something very tangible, to grab the javelin and throw it as, as far as you can. And similarly with discus, it's even heavier. So you have to a bit more. Discus is heavier, but you get momentum. So the technique is really brilliant. Once you master it, it's not so much. Javelin is probably more hard on your body. 
this case is more gentle and it, it, it's beautiful feeling uh, once you master. So really for me was to balance the virtual uh, sitting lifestyle with something more dynamic and something that you can hold in your hand and grab it and throw it as far as you can. Maybe that was my kind of first laugh. When I was 15, I started javelin in my hometown, Gabrovo, Bulgaria. Uh, and since then was a long way. Uh, I, I competed until probably age 25. And then I kind of retired from athletics. But age 42, midlife start, midlife crisis starts to kick in. So I returned to competing. And really within 10 years exactly, I reached the Bulgarian title. Then I was the Balkan champion for like uh, probably 12 countries in the Southeast Europe. Then I was second in Europe in, in I think, was it in Nice? Yeah, in Nice, there were European championship. And then was the crown is uh, 17 in, in Oakland, New Zealand. But the point is on one hand, I'm ambitious and people can feel it and hear it. You know, I'd like to give my best. Um, but on the other, it is a great journey. It is a great journey. And it is particularly throwing. It was physical and I still have injuries here and there, you know, lower back and, and shoulders, but it was uh, even more mental journey because I did a lot of visualization. It's highly technical. The throwing discipline sounds like, you know, you shout and just, but in fact, there is a lot of technique because you need to put sequentially within many seconds, you start with your legs, then you have your core, then your breast, and then you finish with the arm. And if you do it at the same time, it's suboptimal. It will drop much, much shorter. You have to do it in a sequence. In this sequence, have the whip, and it goes further. And in order to synchronize, a lot of visualizing, a lot of analysis, video analysis, and tuning here and there. So it was a mental journey, physical journey, mental journey. And again, it's a teamwork. I mean, I wouldn't, being, you know, age 42 when I started, now I'm just turned 50, um you need you need a coach you need a proper coach and i was lucky enough to find a friend here a russian guy slightly older he was the the soviet union world champion in decathlon so he know all these disciplines you know sprint and throwing and jumping so we developed a good friendship and he was hardcore russian trainer so we have some recordings where he swear at me if i don't do the technique properly and so on but all this, I think all this contributed to this uh, medal. And for sure, you mentioned family, maybe now I'll switch to the family, the support of the family, because I work sometimes 10 hours and before Corona also traveling, time zones, enduring, you come back, you're exhausted. You need some physical exercise to open your eyes, to refresh, to kind of wake up your body. So I go first stadium sort of, and then I come to the kids. So all the support of my wife and the acceptance of the kids and the kids came with me probably not half of the times, but 40% of the times they were with me, particularly the little ones. You know, they were holding the discus and with the kids discus, they were trying themselves. So I think with the family, because there is no much time left. It's a, it's a sad to say it, but uh, you know, I'm a very busy person. So I managed to combine, you know, they came with me they were engaged and made enthusiastic by the training process, you know, with the trainer, what we do, you know, you have to do weights, you have to do flexibility, throwing is very demanding. And uh, they kind of mirrored and, you know, they did the things and uh, they tried, the middle ones tried javelin, the little ones, they still throw balls and different, you know, like rubber javelins and stuff for kids. So uh, I think for them was physical exposure to the new world and also this team spirit and, and, and the joy. And I was also coaching. Sometimes I go, my coach is not there. So he has a group of kids and I would do the warm up with them and they would do the discus and I'll give them tips. So it has been um, um, a, a nice journey from all angles. And now if I go to the family only, I think now I'm even more stretched because home office homeschooling is uh, demanding, uh, particularly now you said five little kids. Now they are not so little. Three of them are teenagers. They are like uh, 17, 15 and, and 13. So they are as big as my wife already. Uh, but sometimes they need help in maths, for example, where I have a master's degree or sometimes depends. My wife covers chemistry. I cover maths. So we split a bit the, the fields. Um, and I think the key in the family is quality time because I cannot provide so much quantity of time. 
But when we do something, we play a lot in the evening. We play board games, uh, particularly the little ones now just learned Bagamon and, you know, poker and all that stuff. And we enjoy it. Uh, I bring them with me outside. I was born in the mountains in Bulgaria, so I love nature. And they come with me for a long walks in, in the forest. So I think the family side, I still feel a bit guilty that, you know, I'm focusing too much on my career but at least I have an anchor of quality times, being sports, being nature, being games, being visiting different places, maybe not so many, but we've been, we've been around. We've been in Bulgaria, many places, Spain, travel in Europe, um, Disneyland for sure, and so on. So it's around those topics where I, I'm kind of a mainly, I, I'm a bit extroverted person and this, you know, I take energy from nature and outside factors. And this is what I share with my kids and they all can windsurf, they can ski. So I'm proud that I brought those skills. We never hired a, a trainer, a ski trainer or a ski teacher or, or windsurf, I kind of managed to, to do that with them. So I kind of give them my passion for sports. Um, and for the rest, um, now it's becoming uh, more leadership challenge as they grow up, they go in the teenage. Um, and I'm very proud of my oldest daughter. I'm not sure I didn't spend so much time with her, uh, but she developed an incredible passion for climate change and sustainability and saving the planet. And um, funny enough, I was the one to, I was asked just by chance, you know, they needed a, a, a German kid speaking uh, English and she's still uh, having a Bulgarian pass, but uh, she speaks uh, fluent uh, both English and German, who is passionate for climate change. Uh, one NGO uh, airs for our oceans uh, in California, they needed this kit for um, you know, there was this case when the six kids from uh, different countries sued the governments for like violating the child rights. And my daughter was the kid representing Germany. For sure, there was an interview processing and some selecting process based on their passion, based on their case studies, what they've done. For example, she has a group in, in her gymnasiums that she kind of founded and she's um, leading. And then that opened up a, a new, um, if you wish, career for her. She was doing it grassroots and now she had a great exposure. She was in the United Nations uh, together with Greta Thunberg and the other kids. Then uh, when she came back, she was immediately on, you know, the first German television, the second interview talk shows with Barbara Schoneberger and other celebrities. So for like three months, I was her secretary, just dealing with her media appointments. Now the media attention is uh, a bit lower, but uh, her passion is still sustaining. And she's given us hard time at home for no plastic at all. And she's vegan. And now I'm the only one who eats fish every now and then. The rest are vegan. So she's driving a big transformation in the family. I don't think this is my contribution. Maybe she is a bit role modeling me, but uh, she has uh, her passion. And my wife is a bit more kind of, much more empathic person than me. I'm more goal oriented. Uh, <clears throat> and I think uh, this combination between idealistic, which comes from my wife and goal centered. And um, she's also a very good public speaker. The, her fir first engagement was with 500 speakers in a, in a theater here in Hamburg. So um, I think she kind of uh, jumped on the speaker stage and uh, career by, by flying. That was a flying star. Wow. Yeah, enough. That, said, no, no, that's not enough. We're going to go deeper. So I'm going to call you on the carpet even more. So I, I, I love the background and it makes mo more sense now. And I understand it. There's one aspect that, that you left out, but I know from your book, but I also know you know it. How do you merge the work with that family and, and your fitness life. So those are almost, no, for most people, those are three separate areas. Yes. But you have, you're busy, you're, you're, you're away, but you've also found a way to merge it and to make it work. And especially during this time you have, I mean, the, the proof is uh, you've done it. Is there some more tricks or tips okay. or things that you can mention in that? respect and um, some aha moments that uh, 
that you've learned even more so now during the lockdown period? If you focus before Corona, before the lockdown, I said I bring kids with me every time I can. And even when I was the European Championship, not Gary, another uh, <laughs> daughter came with me. So I brought them whenever I can. And they appreciate that. Now, during Corona, things changed. I stopped competing. There was no competition. They canceled. It should have been in, in Japan. The next version, they do it every four years. Uh, so I did, this is uh, concrete tips. I do a lot of micro kind of trainings during the day. Not a lot, but I would do like two to three every day. And in fact, it's like time division. That would be the, the title of my secret. I wake up early by nature. I'm an early, early bird. And then I would do the most creative part. Even I would wake up between four and five without a clock. Sometimes it would be like 5.30, but that would be the very latest. So I would have one hour to do creative work. Uh, probably the most challenging thing, sometimes related to planning, sometimes is related to brainstorming. But the biggest, the biggest kind of um, the most fearful task, which if I delay, I probably wouldn't have find time uh, during the day I would do first. So I tackle it in the early hours. And then I go for a walk here um, because walks in COVID works very well, particularly in Germany. And I have some rituals. I do some power breathing from yoga. Uh, I would do some visualization stuff as well. So I have like 15 to 20 minutes, not so much exercise. It's a walk with some breathing techniques and some visualization and some goal setting for the day. And then I come back, I would do breakfast, not every day, but I love doing breakfast, cutting fruits and vegetables and so on. Um, and then although myself now I'm doing 16 hour interval fasting for, I don't know, six months and it works very well, but it's, I'm experimenting now. And then the first half of the day, I have some calls, but in between I will intervene and do some, whenever I can, I will do like half hour, for example, homeschooling help in maths or uh, somebody needs technical help for the Zoom with, with the kids, or we would have you know half an hour or one hour with my wife to go for a walk and, and discuss some things. So these are like micro, micro investments and I need this variety anyway. If I just work eight hours with no interruption, it wouldn't work. So, and then during the day, even if I have like four hours, you know, I have a, a coaching client or I have an online keynote, which is usually like one and a half hours, after that, immediately after this one or two hours, I would take uh, a break and I would do like 20 minutes, something. Now, there are so many things on YouTube where you could do with uh, YouTube and also Instagram. You could do with your own body weight, a few exercises and you have a huge variety, you know, for your core muscles, for every muscle group you could do with your body weight. So I would have like one more powerful session and I would have one more yoga stretching I, because I still do throwing stretching is very important in order to have amplitude to throw far but also to prevent injury so every day I would do sometimes 10-15 minutes and I have my own routines I don't do like you know om um, or other things but I have yoga uh, positions which I practice and I rotate so I think those things um, some power some yoga and probably three times a week, I go for more aerobic exercise. I would go either long walk, long like two, three hours, or I would go um, like 45 minutes run. That gives me the balance. And I would keep it different times depending on my schedule, but I'll try twice a day to do uh, something which energizing me, which brings you know blood in the oxygen. And uh, that, keeps me, that keeps me going. So I didn't lose from Probably I, I didn't go to the gym for, I don't know, maybe six months and, but I didn't lose much of my power because of this body weight stuff. Uh, and the flexibility and the endurance is, is same level. And maybe one more thing, if I have a longer, usually I, I go for this 25 minutes rule. Whenever I start on a task and I have a clear target what I want to achieve, I'm using Alexa and say, Alexa, set an alarm in 25 minutes. And when the 12 min 25 minutes are gone, I just, stand up and do something for five minutes, something physical. Sometimes I would put music, then sing, I would experiment. But I think breaking the routine works very well for me. It's not for everyone, but I think you have to find out what is it for you. For some is more, you know, maybe relax. For some is more maybe art, enjoy your beautiful music or 
try to think, but you have to have all your own thing to increase your productivity. And now there was a, a survey. What is the number one factor that people find more most attractive for working remotely, even before COVID, where it was more of a luxury? Now it's a it's a must. And the number one by far was not by far, but work whenever you like. So you could really uh, design your working schedule as you wish. And that's what I'm taking advantage of over the years. And the second was work wherever you like. So you could choose home, co-location, whatever, during being on an exotic location and so on, um, which also I try with the family. Sometimes when we go to Bulgaria, where I'm from, and my wife, we would stay longer there. And if we stay like three, four weeks, two weeks would be holiday, two weeks I would work maybe half time, the other spend with them. So on this, wherever you like, you could also, if you are solopreneur or I have a small team, but you know, not a, a big organization, you could enjoy those uh, things. So I think that's probably- I think that, that covers quite a bit. What, what people have really been running into, and I mean, it's different all over the world. It, it's really the fact that now <clears throat> we're getting this 24 seven view, especially in lockdown areas of the places that we live. And some of us have been fortunate enough to create a, a home environment, no matter where you live, whether it's an apartment or a house or a condo or, or whatever it is, that is, is pretty nice 24 seven. But uh, overwhelming majority of humanity, especially in developing countries, are, are in a place in, in, under lockdown conditions where it's not that conducive to be there 24 seven. One, there's not high-speed broadband internet. There's not enough computers for all your kids to study. Um, there's no location for you to do your work that you normally do in an office or somewhere else uh, where you're at. And so now we're, we're seeing uh, domestic violence on the rise, a lot of issues with children and with not enough computers and kids missing school or not getting online. We, we're, we're finding that... Um, the utilities and the resources of your home that you're in aren't sufficient for uh, living in 24 seven. Um, that also within those structures that people are working from their beds, they're working from their couch. So bad posture, bad working ergonomics. Um, as you can tell, and you know me for, for years, I always stand whenever we met it live in person, we would always find a table where we could stand and, and have a meal. So there's um, things because we, you and I and, and, uh, have been working remotely and working wherever in the world and working the, the future of work for years, we've figured out how to tackle the ergonomics. We've figured out how to use the right tools uh, for time management. Um, and what I hear out of what you said is that um, it needs to be a work family life balance. And that's really dependent upon time management and how you split it up through discipline. Mm -hmm. Another big thing that we've seen in reports and studies just in the past 12 months about those who are working at home is they're actually working longer hours. They're working more. They're not taking breaks. They're not taking vacations, obviously. They're working on the weekends. There's a little more flexibility, a lot more people working in their underwear, their pajamas, so to say, and only when they have to do a video from the top up and all sorts of plethora of things being experienced in this time. But the key that I hear out from you is not only time management, but there's a it's, it's almost a form of chaotic discipline. So you have a strict time schedule and discipline, a routine, but through that routine, it's a very freeing because you get these micro breaks or a lot of breaks during the day that still involve that family time, that breaking it up over time. Um, uh, for a lot of people, a lot of people feel that that discipline is something scary, that it's a very confining, but discipline is something that's very freeing by getting up earlier, by going to bed earlier, by setting routines and some, some alarm clocks or some, 
some clocks to say, okay, you've worked for a couple hours now. Now it's time for a 20 minute break, a 15 minute break. Doesn't mean start smoking so that you can have a break. It doesn't mean start eating more. Now that you have, have time to break, go, go, go on the couch and eat some more chips. But work on your breathing, work on those other things, work on things with your family that are these mini micro breaks or on your health or your fitness and, and how, how that gets split up. Mm -hmm. To dive really into um, your, before we dive in, in, into your book a little bit more, um, there's a question that's, I'll, I'll let you answer it. There's a question that really ties to, to, to this and what we've talked about. And it's one about being a global citizen and whether you feel like you're a global citizen. So in your bio, I, I mentioned all the languages, your book's been translated in all the languages you speak your family and the way you, you've been all over the world. Um, so I'd like you to answer or say what you just wanted to ask me or, or to say, but then I want to kind of get into a little bit more of this, your global mindset, which ties to virtual power teams, ties to teams all over the world and, and into that thinking, but go ahead. Yeah. So I just based, you asked me for tips. Um, two more came up. So one is, take breaks, take regular breaks. That will make your productivity much, much better. You will see it. Uh, and then, as you say, this chaotic discipline helps a lot. So build the breaks. Then um, I, I recommend people because I'm using it with five little kids and a wife. I have a do not disturb sign. I have my own office, but they still storm and jump. And sometimes it's sweet in the conference, uh, but not always. So I have a sign which I don't abuse. But I have a sign, do not disturb. If, um, if I have an important session that I want to be uh, disturbed, um, it's a simple thing. And um, mm, there was a third one, which probably I will come up later. Um, so breaks, do not disturb. Um, yeah, let's let's keep it for later. There was that, related to that. That's fine. That that happens to me all the time. Uh, you get up there in age, and you read as much as I do. I tend to get some uh, things. Where, what was that thing? I I I I really want to one one other thing. So what most people don't know, you know, we've known each other for a while. But we did a kind of an adventure together one time. We went to um montenegro to the green culture forum and uh, we spoke at the green culture forum we attended it we uh, uh hung out together it was really wonderful actually but it was on a uh, nudist beach island type of a in montenegro uh, close to podgorica i think is how you say it you could probably say it better than i do and and Gorica. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, we went there for this green culture forum where we talked about also different types of, of uh, environmental and food topics and, and other topics, but also, um, you know, speaking and coaching and different things that we did there. And uh, it was really wonderful to see you there. But we have over the years been really working. How, how do you work in remote locations? Not just the speaker, not just traveling. How do you help others to get into these mindsets and, and think about these things? Because there's a huge cultural aspect in, in all of this, a, a extremely huge cultural aspect that applies to the question that I, that I asked you. Do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without borders, nations and divisions of humanity, one from another? What, and how does that tie to virtual power teams? Oh, yes. Beautiful question. Thank you, Mark. So certainly I feel like global citizens and citizen and my life so far without planning and managing it, it's like epitomizing global citizenship because I was born in Bulgaria, a small country in Southeast Europe. Uh, being a very powerful uh, country in the Middle Ages, but, you know, shrinked. Uh, I was born in the communist time, so completely different system until the age of 18. I had uh, the chance to live in the communist uh, society, which have some advantages. I had a very good quality education for free. Um, I didn't have a chance to travel the world until then because it was strictly very restricted. 
Uh, and then age 18, probably it was optimal for me. The regime changed, so I could travel the world. I had the good education. I finished the Sofia University, then the five years I was, until I finished my Master of Mathematics um, studies. Uh, but uh, then my life expanded. I, I had a chance, I started in Bulgaria working for a global company, but I was traveling all over Europe at this time, London, where was the head office and so on. And then by four years later, I was uh, kind of transferred to Hamburg for one year to run a European project. We were establishing in these early days European data center. So we were moving the big servers from Southampton, Budapest to Hamburg. Uh, and then I went to Hungary where I was three years establishing technology shared services for Central Europe. Um, and during that time, I traveled a lot in the Central European countries, including Croatia, Montenegro, where we've met and so on. And then when I came back, I become a global service planner. So a lot of that was uh, doing it, you know, with remotely. Uh, but I also, there was a lot of traveling to, to Asia, mostly Kuala Lumpur, but other countries. So in my work, I had a chance to travel uh, a lot, to meet even more people from all countries on the, on the map, whatever, 190 plus countries, uh, work with them, sometimes lead them, sometimes be peers with them. Uh, so it was very rich uh, experience. And I kind of my communist past and a small Bulgarian past gave me some roots, gave me some unique perspective, but then I had a chance to see the world. And now um, with the virtual power teams, once I saw that the, the borders and the distance is not a barrier, because I had, when I was here, I run a project for this data center where we had the European scope, then the one that you mentioned best of the best 2006, 2007, it was establishing a global shared services and I was responsible for the European rollout, 30 countries. It was expanding. Then as head of IT services, I had a hundred plus teams spread across Russia, I mean, Eastern Europe, the whole Middle East, and then the whole of Africa. So the geography expanded and I saw geography is not a barrier. Time zones, you could work around it if you have a people to people, heart to heart connection. Uh, cultures, you could, you know, if you could leverage on this diversity, it becomes much more fun and much more successful. So I saw that you can unite people, you could unite talents, and I believe everyone is a star, everyone is a talent. It's really the role of the leader to, to discover it, and not just of the leader, to create an environment where they could shine. And in the virtual power teams, one of the big rocks is the strength matrix, but we discovered each and everyone the natural strengths and talents of the people. We put it in the matrix with avatar, completely new feeling emerges because everyone with his rich history coming with unique talents. And this really makes me on one hand citizen of the world, on one, on the other hand, very passionate enabler to unite global talents on a particular cause, on a particular purpose with a strong why. And that's why now I still work with the global organizations in the business front, but I'm even more passionate about the NGOs where people really trying to tackle the toughest challenges. And I know you do a lot of work in this space, in the food, in the sustainability. So yes, my history, maybe I'm lucky because I was born in such a way, I had a chance to travel early enough. I was exposed to these big projects and it developed as a passion. And really, if you can leverage the diversity, we have a, a, a method to define the optimal culture of a, of a virtual team based on the cultures involved on free scales. So it is systematic as a mathematician, but it's also a discovery process, exploring and discovery process. And they decide, they don't impose anything. So I love uh, that. I mean, one yeah. thing that really gets me in your book, uh, in your books is really that you're there, there's, there's one, the really the understanding of uh, uh, of the power of a virtual power team. So, and then you go into the power of diversity, uh, the diversity of that team, what each member, despite age, gender, culture can bring to that. And then you, you also go deeply into these new emerging forms of, of, of leadership. So uh, are there some people there that haven't had a voice before that are, are actually you can inspire and find new ways, new working environments from people that you might not have recognized before and how to really unleash the top performance and, and over all of these groups with all of the pillars. And you have a very, I don't want to give it, 
give it all away, but this, this systematic thing. And so in the book, my, my favorite section, uh, I, I actually even have it bookmarked is it's all around building optimal team um, culture. Mm. It's the 10th chapter. And um, the reason why is multifaceted. So obviously it's all a systemic approach. It's multifacets of a system. And, you know, there's principles and ways to do it effectively. But um, there's a strong focus on diversity and culture and, and this, this virtual conglo uh, conglomerate of indigenous wisdoms, wisdoms from around the world that maybe because of COVID, but maybe just because their organization is global or international, need to find a way to be bipartisan, to work together, to, to come together and, and um, make their organization, no matter what kind of organization work. And so one, you get very specific to what type of organization, how are they structured and how can you make them powerful and effective as, as much as possible. But the reason I like the cultural part, and I'll come right out and tell you, is human evolution takes millions to billions of years for, for Homo sapien to evolve. But when we get technology, virtual technologies, emerging technologies uh, uh, mixed with cultural evolution, through cultural evolution, through diversity, and through seeing perspectives in a different way we haven't seen before on a much global way, and what I call, and you've heard my talks before, with this overview effect or this cosmic perspective, then that is the only way that humanity can evolve much faster than the traditional ways we've evolved. And, and part of it, it it's, it's multifaceted as well, because, you know, if we're democratic republic or we're Christian or Muslim or whatever, those are all things that divide us to get ahead, to reach the future faster. But if we can evolve a culture from an organization, the organizations that you help, to have that diversity, to have that culture, it is a way for us to evolve much faster to reach that beautiful future that we really all want, that where we all really want to go. And so that's the chapter I like the most. And I, I mean, I don't want to give away all your secrets because you have, you do, you do these workshops and work with teams for weeks to months to make sure they they reach their project, their objectives, mm -hmm. that they work well together, that they know how those tools work until you feel comfortable to turn it over to them. And I guess they, they go off and finish their project and maybe report back later to you. But I would love to hear some other vital things that you can maybe tease or tell us about that are also vital for us to know, especially during this time of lockdown that, that maybe would, would tickle us of why we may, need to get even smarter or a little bit more wiser about some of the tools, some of the things that we should be doing to, to evolve a little bit faster. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you, Mark. And I'll come back to this cosmic view um, in the end of my uh, now uh, statements. Um, so you mentioned the culture. Culture is key. I, I make a metaphor, you know, the virtual team, if you imagine it as a human being with a head, the body and the heart, the my 10 big rocks, uh, which is the method comprised of the 10 big rocks, they're linked to this um, body. The first three are in the head. And here, um, I probably wouldn't go through all 10 now, but the first three are the cognitive, the logical part. And the very first is important personality in focus particularly if you have a new team member, so you don't have a chance to meet and your team is dynamic, you need to seed the trust. You need to seed the interpersonal relationships and then with a structured communication, make them thrive. And I develop a format where very quickly with a live journey and particular moderation, people go very deep within minutes, like five to 10 minutes. And there is even a flash intro with only four questions, which people go deep and they, they engage. I remember I worked with a Japanese client in Frankfurt and Japanese who are usually reserved. We did the flash intro in peer groups, in the groups of two. 
it usually takes five minutes uh, all together, two minutes per person, just four questions. After the workshop, it was two days workshop in the night. Most of them stayed until three, four o'clock in the bar, still pondering on the four questions. There was so much discussion uh, going on. So personality in focus and their formats, which really help to, to bridge and to connect heart to heart. Strengths matrix, as I mentioned, don't keep the people just as um, the biggest problem of poor lead team, they feel isolated. They just feel a resource. They don't feel connected, disconnected and so on. We discovered their natural strengths and talent. We made them official to everyone. We work even with avatars. So they kind of, and everyone starts feeling like a hero, like a star bringing these unique talents. And then setting the goal bottom up is, is very key. Um, you, the more virtual your team, the more locations, time zones and cultures, the less you as a manager would know what is the best goal. So the why to some extent, it's, is the, it's, it's, a, it's a big factor. You may come with a why and attract the right people, but on the what you certainly have to do it in the workshop format as a team. And then we have a method, systematic approach, three-step approach to develop the goal bottom up. And then we build strategic roadmaps that goes to this goal and there is no delegation. It's a key, simple but key step. People voluntarily pick the sub goals on their own maps, the milestones, and take ownership. And they commit. And it's much more, they take, they pick it based on their strengths. They argumented because this relates to my strengths. And the more you work in your strength area, the more joy you have, the more you are in flow, and so on. So, those things about setting the goal bottom up in a collaborative, co creative process, not delegating, but people picking. These are key elements. So from the other 10, that was the head. Head is very fundamental because it establishes the big why and the big what. I always compare the virtual team with the atom. Where you have in the atom, you have a nucleus and then various particles flying around. And in a virtual team, similarly, we, our goal, our aim is to retain the gravity, I call it, you know, the, the gravity between the, ver between the particles, which are the team members in this case, towards the nucleus, but the nucleus is not the manager or whatever happened to be project manager, HR manager. This is the team purpose and goal. And therefore we do it in a creative team effort. If the nucleus is there, then key is to establish a structured communication. Google did a research, Project Aristotle, maybe some of the participants know it, can research it. So they wanted to see what their top performing teams have in common, their best performing teams. So they research at some point, they discover that they have an equal share of talking. That means in some, at some point, even the extroverts manage to shut up and then the introverts to speak up and they end with like equal share of talking. But that was not the only thing. So I think this is something, a discovery which I emulate in my method. Many of the update meetings, we do it in such a way that everyone is having an equal share by design to prevent some you know, bosses dominating the discussion or in case of problem finger pointing and so on. But Google discovered there were some exceptions. Still some teams delivered great results and there is no equal share of talking. They continued researching and the number one characteristic without any exception was psychological safety. They called it by developer a term, which means their team members feel safe enough to, make, to take risks, not being afraid that they will be laughed at or they will have a negative consequence for their career. They take risk, they show their vulnerability, they show their weaknesses, they feel safe enough, they ask for help, they give help. So all this encompasses the psychological safety. And now we, in the structured communication where the next three big rocks, forums and agenda, what meetings do you need? What's the agenda? Who take part? We kind of embody these principles. We establish a structured communication that everyone can contribute and shine, not the manager dominates or some other extroverts. We do knowledge management there, which we linked it to the strengths. We develop the topics and nominate knowledge champions, which are the custodians of particular field. We do regular feedback, decide consciously as a team, how often we touch base as a team, how often we get feedback one-on-one -on -one with the manager. So that's the body part, the dynamic. And the, the last part, the heart, my favorite is about the culture, like your favorite book chapter. The optimal team culture, as you said, there is a methodic, free scales, leadership, decision-making, conflict. The team consciously picks the scale and they debate, how can I enable this culture? Because sometimes if you have like Chinese, very hierarchical, maybe a big stretch if they have to operate in a more egalitarian culture because the team 
uh, chosen it. So there is a lot of group debate and self-reflection. How can I enable it? How our leader can enable it? And then we have the winning spirit, another one, uh, which is um, usually I work with various forms of recognition despite the distance, including a bidding prize for outstanding performance. And it worked in various industries delivered. People really went extra mile with this. If you do it right, if you don't go for traditional bonus or, or money, but team experience. Then we have a recognition, the number one reason for people leaving companies, actually leaving bosses, not companies, due to lack of recognition. And I usually say, uh, if there is one secret to lead the family with six women, this is praise, praise, praise. What to praise? Praise the result, if there is a result, if they you know, achieved something. If there is no result, but they help each other, the behavior is uh, you know, supportive in the team spirit, praise the behavior. If there is neither result nor behavior, look harder. There is always something to praise, but be authentic. So in the recognition, we kind of develop a virtual praise from many different aspects. We gamify it and so on. And then uh, I mentioned uh, recognition, uh, optimal team culture, diversity, and, next, and um, the winning spirit. And 10 is like a bit futuristic, like yourself. It's next generation leaders, how to involve you know, the, your millennials, your digital natives, but also that's why it's Power Team Beyond Borders, how to reach out uh, beyond your organizational boundary, how to motivate, inspire, and have, you know, attracted in your gravity field, uh, different organizations, communities of practice, NGOs. In the book, there is a story which they do hackathons and various forms, but with a strong why they manage to attract. And I will just say, from the cosmic perspective, as you said, which is really, I fully share your view that if we manage the diversity right, we could accelerate our evolution and reach the vision state much faster. On this vision state, there is a, um, there is a research which uh, shows that in the universe, I'm not sure, some people may debate it, you know, some of the terminology, but I'll put it in a very plain terms. In the universe, only 10% is material. 10% are planets and stars, as we know, the matter. Then 20% is like nothing, black holes or the phenomena that scientists still cannot explain. And 70% is invisible energy, like the gravity that holds the universe together. And in the virtual team, it's similar. 10% are the team members and the infrastructure. 20% are still undeveloped potentials. And 70%, the major part, is the relationships, the trust, the gravity that holds your virtual team together. So the art to lead virtual teams is to focus on the 70%. And I assure everyone on our listeners, they will be amazed by the wonderful fruits to come. That's, that's beautiful. And I mean, uh, you, you do this for a lot of people. So another good friend of ours is uh, Conrad Gula from Keeb. You yep. helped him and his teams. It's a the big, huge international company that has people all over the world working on projects as, uh, um, and, and like what you're doing uh, as well or getting starting to do for the World Food Program who last year won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize uh, for their work and efforts, humanitarian works around the world. The thing is, is what I understand and I wanna clarify it, you would take a team and um, uh, of leaders internally to get ready to prepare them how to work virtually, how to work as a team, how to build that team, give them this training and this experience um, of one of your workshops, your courses, and then they, with those tools and that empowerment, then go off and work on their pro projects specifically. For example, the World Food Program does accelerators every year and does a lot of innovations. It's the innovation hub. And so they do a lot of things in, in that respect. Um, is there any time that you come in where you say, we don't have time to, to have you train us before we do this project? We've got this project to do. How can you help us rally everybody around this project? And, and you're just like, doing both at once as you're working on the project. Have you had experiences like that before? Usually, usually it starts with the keynotes when we could invite not just the leaders of the organization, but the entire organization, because there is no limit on the participants and the tools are scalable enough. So that would be the inspiration. They could see 
the method explained the 10 big rocks, they could see various case studies and I would vary depending on what organization it is. I would bring the similar industries or similar challenges that they face. And then we go into the workshops, which usual format would be like um, eight, uh, two days, 16 hours, but broken down in a two hours uh, kind of blocks. Because if you have a global team, it is uh, a luxury to find more than two hours. Usually you have this window between like 12 and, and two o'clock, which is the optimal, they call it golden window where you catch the Australians, the Europeans, and the East Coast is comfortable, West Coast will be very early, but still possible. So we would break down this uh, 16 hours in eight blocks of two hours. And then I would be available, uh, we usually schedule a monthly because in this, 80, in this 16 hours, we develop the strategic roadmaps for this organization, which are very specific. We develop a strength matrix, which is an enabler. We develop the structure communication, the team charter, which has the forums, who takes part and so on. And we develop the optimal team culture on the scales, people choose it. So these are the key outcomes where now they go on on their strategic roadmaps and start delivering. And I would be available for a monthly usually again, two hour coaching, a group coaching where we debate and so on. And if necessary, I'm available for individual session working on particular program with particular leader. So it is a journey with a, with a strong start, usually for the whole organization to know what we are embarking on. Then the workshop to set the foundation, to tune the 10 big rocks for their industry reality and challenges. And then it's a process to ensure that those roadmaps get delivered. Yeah, that's beautiful. What, what I've run into, and I believe you mentioned this earlier in our offline when we were speaking that uh, we, we've been talking about these things, uh, the future of work and, and, and things for quite some time. And some organizations and companies never put those things into practice, never said, hey, we need to get our employees trained. We need to prepare to have the right tools and, and, and thinking in place. So, for, for the future, for when, when something like the lockdown or the future of these new projects will emerge. Um, the, the minute the pandemic hit, almost immediately, I started receiving calls from people saying, hey, we, we heard you talk about sustainability and environmental social governance and reporting and planning. And can you help us get back in business? Can you help us open our doors? Can you help us get up to speed, reinvent our business models? I'm sure uh, you, and you've told me that people have been uh, calling you, knocking down your door saying, boy, we didn't implement them. We didn't take your training, um, but now we desperately need it because we've got this international team. They're all definitely not traveling to the office anymore and we need some help because we have some big projects or we're getting ready to go back to work uh, and, and we need to have a different model. We need to have some tools. So uh, what have you seen in that as people have been calling you and, and what, do you, what do you tell them? Are you turning people away or are you, you, you're ready to go and help, help everybody who calls you? Yeah. No, I'm currently, I don't discriminate in any industries. You know, I work in the last seven years with um, 100 plus clients uh, from, you name it, probably most of them IT companies uh, from the very big ones to like keep, you mentioned a scaling now international company. When we started, there were, I don't know, maybe 20 people company. Now they have locations in USA and uh, they, they're really scaling, scaling big time. Um, so industry is not specific. I work with recently with many banks because they feel pressure of fintech and so on, uh, but also automotive, also manufacturing, uh, you name it, the NGOs. So um, it, it's interesting to mention that uh, I still have the luxury not to turn people away because my focus, my, my approach is very focused. We're talking about two days broken down and then once a month coaching. I can still serve many clients. It's not like a big engagement on a particular client. But uh, now during Corona, there were, for example, two different uh, problems or three I will mention briefly. One which was most excited and it's reflected in the book, a biotech company engaged me, uh, which they develop among others, a vaccine against, um, a vaccine against uh, COVID-19. And they, from day one, they put the challenge and that motivated me a lot. 
they said we are in our r d space we uh, go for competition which is you know word from uh cooperation or collaboration cooperation co and then competition so in the r d space this biotech they um cooperate with 12 other biotechs on the leading edge and they share open their books and they cooperate to develop the vaccine and then when they are ready they will compete on the market so that's pre-agreed for me that was a new concept then i researched and i seen that you know amazon and apple did it with the kindle and uh, then in the automotive toyota did it with some competition so it was not a very new concept but it kind of gave me a lot of fuel and with them we work with the global r d boss and the HR department, the HR team, and we went through the whole process. So it was very motivating for them. The challenge was beyond their organizational boundary, how to make this global community of, you know, managers, uh, R&D specialist experts, some research fellows, university and so on to make it work. I think that gives me also wind in my sails for tackling bigger problems now. COVID is like just uh, one case study. So this was very good because they really reached out and said, we want to enable, enable a global community with a very noble um, goal and purpose. So let's see what can we do together. The other one was another very common case. That was a manufacturing company and they simply struggled for their knowledge workers was kind of okay. They, they managed to work remotely. But they have a, a lot of hybrid teams, you know, the manufacturing team that have to produce, in this case, they produce cement and other kind of uh, products for the, for the building industry. So how their managers can manage these hybrid teams with must be, you know, blue collar workers, still kill them motivated. And the office, which is, you know, 10% in the office, the other 90% work from home. So that was another case study, which is very relevant for all these industries where you cannot do it remotely everything remotely um so and the third one was this scale up where uh, really they they have been remote but they are growing a lot and they started facing retention issues and then we focus a lot on the culture on your favorite uh, subject and and a chapter and also on various ways of recognition in order to keep people motivated and it's really not everybody is equally suited for virtual work you have to as you said you know this chaotic discipline, but discipline being a self-starter, self-motivator is crucial. If you need people, you know, to chat around, you need to provide for those people now to bridge the gap other ways, other communities, other ways to feel part and, you know, sense of belonging. And this is where we work particularly in terms of recognizing their progress, gamifying it, uh, working on the optimal team culture, which when they choose it, it comes with the elements. So yeah, that was the, the three of the challenges that we've been resolving during the Corona times. Yeah, that discipline's hard, a, a, re a really hard one for some people to grasp. But the the other, the flip side of that is those those people who have been who had before the COVID been going from nine to five or into a job during eight hours a day for forty hours a week. The uh, big majority of them were punching in a time clock. They were punching out for breaks. They're punching out for lunch. They were being micromanaged. Their time was very controlled. And uh, that's, that's a different form of discipline. It's more a form of control by those who are employing you, micromanaging your time, making sure you're on time, making sure you punch in and out, and kind of you know looking over your shoulder to make sure you're on task. Um, this this freedom that you mentioned earlier that people really want to work whenever they can and have flexible hours as long as they put in the hours or that they serve the customer's needs uh, during certain times is profoundly important, but it's a different form of chaotic discipline that's really uh, can be a very freeing thing and much better than having to punch in and out uh, all the time. It's just, it's a different way of looking at it. Um, I have four last questions before we go over our time that I have for you. Um, the, this first one is actually the hardest one that I will give you. And I want your answer. I don't want what you think Merkel or uh, the Bulgarian government or anyone else thinks, I wanna know your answer, and it's the burning question, WTF, and no, it's not the swear word, it's what's the future 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting question. I believe we will, as you mentioned, we will work more um, remotely, but uh, now many companies and HR directors really struggle with the winning spirit. It's been too long and hopefully we will have, uh, you know, lockdowns, less lockdowns and so on. Um, so they struggle with really maintaining the spirit. Even people that trust each other now, there is a fatigue and also from online uh, meetings and so on. So I think we will work more virtually but with more joy. So that's where virtual power teams come to make enjoyable, to make it uh, purposeful, to make it fulfilling. Uh, and with my motto, uniting global talents to, to resolve the toughest challenges that will provide people really to choose the cause that they want to contribute to and a method. So they really work with brilliant minds across the globe, passionate for this topic. So I think we will see more of that in the corporate world, going beyond the organizational boundaries, engaging with experts from other organizations uh, in order to achieve your goal. And on the nonprofit uh, sector, I think we'll see people really a more, commu more communication, more competition, more co-creation, more community of practice, which currently is more around brainstorming. I feel they'll go to the next level to really resolve things, not just help each other, but formulate you know, common goals and achieve those goals. So I think there will be more of it, but with more joy and more fulfillment. That's great. If there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would that be, your message? Mm -hmm. I think, I think um, I'll say two things. I think you have to, you have to believe in yourself uh, you have to shine as much as you can. Um, don't limit yourself. I would now link it a bit to Nelson Mandela, who said, allowing yourself to shine, you allow others also. You, there is no purpose in, in playing small. So believe in yourself. Set a, a, a very brilliant moonshot vision for yourself. That's the first part of the message. And second one comes from one quote that I, that I laugh and uh, I live. And it is, uh, it's a, if you dream alone, and I would encourage you to dream alone a lot, this is just a dream. This is more to fuel your power. But if we dream together, this is the beginning of a new reality. So share your dream. There is a way to connect with like-minded people, share your passion, and then we could really create a new reality, a much more beautiful one. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Um, maybe it's a cliche, but coming from communistic, you know, first 18 years of my life, where, you know, the boss is the smartest, I was coming from a perspective that, you know, to you have to know all the answers. And like my first four or five years of my professional career, I had a lot of uh, issues with that and limiting the performance of my teams. But all of a sudden, I realized on the hard way that actually that's absolutely not true. And you as a leader, and even now more in virtual teams, you don't see, you are enabler. So you need to let the other shine. Uh, the answer is there in this, you know, brain swarm uh, intelligence that you have as a team and even expanding it, all answers are there. So <laughs> make people connect have a clear view. You don't have to be a, a, the smartest or knowing it all. You are just an enabler. Believe in it. Have a strong gravity, you know, be humble. And then uh, the great results are to come and a lot of fulfillment as well. And the last one is really, is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you would really like my listeners to know or think about um, as we, we've been blessed because you've really shared your insights and thoughts and let us in inside your ideas and, and your book and uh, your world, which I'm very thankful for. But is there anything else that you would like to depart to my listeners that you maybe didn't get to? And then that's all I have for you. Yeah. Well, you, you, you guided me so well. So thank you, Mark. I think I've mentioned uh, everything and beyond. Um, Nothing really, it's the same thing, you know, share your dream, have a strong dream, share it, and then um, 
not sky is the limit universe will support us and we could have a really beautiful uh, beautiful future sustainable enjoyable um, and fulfilling thank you so much peter it's been a sheer joy and i know we'll see and talk to each other very soon and uh, i have a feeling you have a few more books up your sleeve so uh we'll be seeing great things from you and i hope to talk to you very soon take care thanks for having me Mark. Thank you.